Hello everybody, welcome to the Raptors Trade Tier List video. Uh, this will be my first long form video that I've made in a long time. I've been mostly doing shorts. Uh, I'll explain why at the end of the video, but I love tier lists. Uh, they're, they're some of my favorite content to watch on YouTube. I hope you're the same. And uh, it's really great for me because it's very easy to make. So uh, <laughs> if no. you like it, please let me know in the comments. But without any further ado, let's get to the tier list. Um, so there are five different um, tiers. So first off, very likely to be traded. I don't think they're going to be on the team next season. There's a world where they are, but I don't think that they will. Uh, wouldn't be surprised. More of a 50-50 shot, maybe a little less likely than likely, but I wouldn't be surprised. Next, not counting it out. So a little less likely. I expect them to be back, but it's not written in stone. I doubt it, but... But possible, I, I don't really think they're going to be traded or I, I'm pretty sure they're going to be on the team next season. And Untouchable, really doubt it. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, not everybody in this tier will be Untouchable, but I just don't think that the conditions are going to be there for them to be traded. So let's start off and we're going to start with the juiciest one because this guy has been in lots of trade rumors recently and that is Bruce Brown. And now Toronto Raptors beat writer uh, Doug Smith released an article with a scoop that basically said uh, Toronto Raptors management are trying to sh are shopping this guy trying to get rid of him and um, <laughs> he kind of shopped himself during the season if you recall that uh, there were tons of trade rumors swirling but he talked to the media and said like anything Tom Thibodeau needs me to do I'm a dog I'll do it for him it's like you're still on the Raptors. <laughs> like, I know it's not a match made in heaven, but like, what are you doing? I, I don't think he's on the team next season. I'll be honest. Um, I think it makes sense that the Raptors are trying to trade him while, you know, his championship run where he was a key role player on that Nuggets team is still fresh in people's imagination. Uh, he did not have a good season with the Raptors, especially compared to the expectations for him. We saw how good he could be playing next to a superstar like Durant or like um, uh, Nikola Jokic. Those guys made him look good because he could stand in the corner, hit threes, do the hustle thing, guard like some of the, the best perimeter players on the other team, just kind of be a role player. And on the Raptors, I think that it was a combination of not, there's not a lot of talent, especially when the Raptors were tanking. So maybe he they asked him to step up. And I think a lot of it also was basically um, he's on a bad team, time to get my stats. And there was a lot of ball dominance. He didn't make great decisions. It just, it just didn't work out. And I don't think that the team wants him back. And I don't think that he wants to be back on the Raptors next season. And I think he has value. So add all those things together. And I would be very surprised if he was on the team next season. And I think they're going to try and deal him as Doug Smith pointed out at the draft. I think that they're going to trade him near the draft. And um, so that's my take. He is right at the top. Next off, let's go in order. So Emmanuel Quickly. Emmanuel Quickly is a free agent this off season. Um, he was probably one of the biggest pieces to be brought back in the OG Ananobi trade. At the time, he was definitely the guy that everybody was excited about and thought was like the big piece that came back. And he had a good season with the Raptors. It started off a bit slow, but then he regained his shot and he looked good until, um, you know, the personal tragedy with RJ Barrett and there were some injuries. But the Raptors are looking to bring this guy back. And because he's a free agent, it would have to be a sign and trade. Sign and trades are not very common in the NBA. And the reason is because all the parties have to agree to it. So instead of just the two teams agreeing to trade a player, the player also has to agree to sign the contract. So the contract has to be good for the player. The contract has to be good for the team that's trading for him. And then everybody has to agree. So it doesn't happen very often. And also, I think that the team is looking to keep him. I think that they view him as a core piece. He's an exciting young player that people are excited about, including myself. So I just... I don't see a scenario where he gets traded. I just, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, next up, okay, Ochai Agbaji. Now, Ochai was brought in last season around the trade deadline. 
He was traded for um, basically a late first. The Toronto Raptors got a late first for Pascal Siakam, and then they turned that late first, I mean, among other things, um, but they turned the late pick that they got for uh, for Pascal Siakam into Ogbaji and Kelly Olynyk, And um, Ogbaji still has upside. He's a little older than you would expect being a third year player, but up until recently, the uh, uh, basically until this season, I think the Jazz viewed him as a core piece. This season, his shooting just did not materialize, and um, they traded him for a pretty small return, a late first, later than where he was drafted, plus uh, Kelly Olenek, who I think also has a bit of value as well. Um, that said, he didn't have a great uh, tenure with the Raptors this year, but I think part of that is due to the fact that he is a role player that excels, would excel his archetype excels playing next to star players in that he is a three and D guy if his three point shot comes around. And it's not as grim as you might think because his three point percentage was not very good this season, but, but his corner three point percentage was actually quite good. I believe it was around or over 40% from the corners. And that is a shot that is generated by having a star player on your team that draws help and then kicks it out. And that was in short supply when Scotty Barnes and to a lesser extent, Jakob Pertl went down with injury. Um, so with all of that being said, I think that the Raptors still kind of like him as a prospect. He had a down shooting season and he's not as good as, or maybe doesn't have as much potential as other people thought he did. Um, but I would, Simply put it in him in, I doubt it, but it's possible. He's making, next season will be the year that they have to tender his qualifying offer. Um, so he's making around 5 million-ish a season. He'd be easy to trade if they needed to, but I think that they see him as a potentially valuable piece. And I don't know how much value he would have in the around the league. Um, so I'll put him at the top of, I doubt it, but possible. Um, next up, Scotty Barnes. This is the easiest one, um, even easier than Bruce Brown. I think, I don't know, 99 plus percent chance that Scotty Barnes is back with the team next season. He exceeded pretty much all expectations for him this season. He was an all-star. He was, you know, had a fantastic, especially the beginning of the season, he looked like a s potential superstar. And... The amount that other teams would have to give up for him would, is just far more than I think any team would be considering. And I think that he's worth more to the Raptors in this developing position than he would be to any other team. So I just don't see a world where Scotty Barnes isn't with the Raptors next season. So that's pretty easy. Let's not waste any more time. Let's move on. So RJ Barrett, um, more interesting in terms of being a tradable player. So. The Knicks obviously traded him, and at that point, he was considered pretty widely around the league by neutral observers to be a negative contract. They gave him a large contract extension when he was eligible, and frankly, with the Knicks, um, between Brunson and Randall, he just did not live up to it. Uh, Thibodeau was asking him to do stuff that I don't think was his strength as a player, uh, namely being a 3 and D guy. So. His defense is like, okay, it's not great. Uh, and his three point shot is inconsistent. And he's certainly not a plus three point shooter that you can run off screens and he, he's not hitting off the dribble threes, that kind of stuff. He's a catch and shoot three point shooter and he hit above his expected three point percentage here in Toronto. His skill as a player is being a slasher that gets into the paint and can finish very well with his left hand or create the one of the greatest the, the best things about him uh, that he did this season was being able to create for others he would penetrate use a screen break guys down off the dribble and then get into the paint and either finish or create a play for somebody else and that slashing role kind of re revitalized him as a player and he looked great for the raptors so that's kind of where he's at i don't know like it's hard to be down on a guy when they have just had seemingly a career revelation where they look like they are, you know, living up to their potential. 
And it, it's an easy trap to fall into to say like, he's going to maintain this new sort of plateau that he's reached. Um, that said, I don't think the Raptors are in any hurry to trade him. Um, I think that with the uncertainty around his production, I think other teams might be reticent to trade for such a large contract. And he's from Canada. He's a great locker room guy. Seems like a really nice person. Seems to get along with Scotty and, and quickly. I don't think they're in a hurry to trade him, but it's not like it's like unfeasible for him to be traded. So I'm just going to put him in. I doubt it, but possible. Let's move on. Next, Kelly Olenek. Okay, so Kelly Olenek was the other piece in the Agbaji trade. Um, it was kind of surprising that the Raptors traded for him because he's an older player. He's in his 30s and he was on an expiring contract. What the Raptors did was kind of savvy. And this is when you look into the deal that they gave him, it'll make a little bit of sense and, and, and it won't be surprising where I put him. Um, so the way that extensions work is that if you give a player a contract that has a raise over the current contract of more than 5%. So if he makes 5% more in his upcoming contract, then you can't trade him for six months or if you give them a contract of more than two years. So if either of those things are true or both are true, you cannot trade that player for six months. But if you look at his contract, he's making about the same as he did this past season, and the contract is for two years. So guess what? That means that the Raptors, if they wanted to, could trade him this off season. And because he's a veteran, and because he probably has value around the league, I'm going to take him I'm going to put him here and not counting it out. And so they've mentioned a couple of times, just we like Kelly, the front office and Darko both like Kelly. He's a ball mover. He can help run your, your offense. He can stretch the floor out. He's not a very good defender. He's a mediocre rebounder. He's very savvy. Let's put it that way. He, he gets away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, I like him. Uh, but, you know, I could easily see the Raptors trading him. Um, next up. Okay, Javon Freeman Liberty. So, the only two players that I put on the, the list that were that are not under contract for next season are Emmanuel Quickly and RJ Barrett. Um, Javon Freeman Liberty is under contract next season. His contract is unguaranteed, or, or partially guaranteed, excuse me, which means that if they want to you know, not bring him back, they'd only lose a, a fraction of his contract. Um, I like Javon Freeman Liberty. I think he plays the game under control. He has good burst. Um, he has a shooting potential. Let's put it that way. He's a good defender. He's pretty big for the point guard position. I don't know. He just seems like a pretty good player. Kind of young, not, not too old. Um, but with that said, he is making about $2 million a season and is not a core piece of the team and is only under contract for one more season. Those kinds of guys with those um, qualities that I just mentioned get traded all the time. If there's a deal that comes around and you need to make contracts work, those types of guys get traded. So let's just put him here in not counting it out because if a deal comes around and he needs to be part of it, they will put him in the trade. Let's just put it that way. Okay, next up. I... Jalen McDaniels, okay. The other McDaniels brother, um, let's just be blunt. Uh, he was one of probably the, the worst Raptor to ever get substantial playing time that I've ever seen. And I've been following the team for a very long time. He was very poor. I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna completely heap on the guy, but really did not have a good season. The Raptors signed him for to a two-year contract, about four and a half million each season. So this past season and then this upcoming season, he has another year on his contract. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure that they like to trade him. I think part of the reason that he's got as much playing time as he did is because of the second year on his contract. I'm sure that if he had, he was a one-year guy, they would have just put him on the bench and said, sorry. Um, there are not going to be any teams knocking down the Raptors door to try and get this guy. If they need to make space or they just want to get rid of him, they could. But you probably have to include something like maybe a future second round pick or something to get off his contract. 
Um, or if there's a trade and, and there's contracts that, that need to be that need to be included to make it work. It, it, 4.5 million is right around that area where um, he could definitely be included. And it's small enough that it's not like an albatross for another team. So I'll put him in not counting it out. I mean, honestly, I don't really want to watch him play next season. And I'm sure the Raptors are probably in the same boat. Um, but, you know, they signed him to a two-year deal and he's, he's not very good. So they might have to just you know, keep him on the team next season. Okay, uh, let's talk Jakob Pertl because I have spoken about Jakob Pertl in the past, especially when it comes to his value on the market. So Jakob Pertl is a good player. And I know that some people don't think so. And let me just put it this way. S centers, traditional big men who rebound, um, protect the basket, score inside, that's nobody's favorite player. Nobody is, you know, super excited to watch that type of player play. But in terms of building a team and the things that you need in order to win games, if you've been watching the Western Conference Finals, you'll know what I'm saying. Rim protection, rebounding, interior scoring, and just size is really important to having a functioning defense and he's kind of a bellwether he's kind of a fulcrum for what the raptors are going to be like next season so if the raptors want to compete next season they will probably keep Jakob purtle if they're looking to tank next season and get a high draft pick then they'll probably trade Jakob purtle and because nobody else on the team has his particular set of skills um so I think I'm going to take him and I'm going to put him in wouldn't be surprised. So I've mentioned the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Memphis Grizzlies. Those are two teams to keep an eye on when it comes to Jakob Pertl. Both of those teams are looking for a guy who could, you know, do what he does. And I like him as a player. I would like it if, if they're trying to, you know, win games next season. I'd like him to be back if they're trying to tank next season, you know. I would not be surprised to see Jakob Pertl you know, wearing another jersey. Okay, next up, Grady Dick. So Grady Dick had the worst start to a season I've ever seen from a non-bust. So I've seen players busts, like high draft picks, play worse than him. There are guys that have been worse than Grady Dick or had a worse start to the season than Grady Dick did. But they're all busts. They were all like, ended up being bad players. With that said, he had a great second half of, of his rookie season. So like, I mean, my goodness, I was like tearing my hair out watching him because they spent a lottery pick to draft this guy and he was shooting in the low twenties and that was his skill. So it was tough to watch. But in the second half of the season, you know, when the stakes were low and he got a lot of touches and can play through his mistakes and whatnot. He actually showed that he has some promise. And um, I don't think that um, the, the Raptors are looking to trade Grady Dick, but if they, maybe if they needed to sweeten a trade or if there's like a big deal that, that was happening, I could, I, let me say that I could see them trading him if it was part of a larger deal where they needed to sweeten the pot slightly in order to get something back that they valued more. So, I will put him here in the, I doubt it, but possible um, between Agbaji and uh, RJ Barrett. Next up, Gary Trent Jr. Uh, Gary Trent Jr., like quickly, is a free agent this season. So in order to trade him, it would have to be a sign and trade. And as I mentioned, all the things that I said with quickly are very true when it comes to um, Gary Trent Jr. It, they're tough to make work. With that said, I think it's more likely I could, it's in the realm of possibility to see a sign and trade with Gary Trent Jr. I don't think the front office sees him as a core piece on the team. He does have a very in demand skill. He can come off screens and shoot the ball. He is a really good shooter and teams value that. I could see the Raptors going a bunch of different ways with Gary Trent Jr. I think that they could give him the contract he's looking for and he's back. I could see them letting him walk or I could see him 
uh, in a sign and trade, although I think that is less likely than the other two options. So I'm going to move some guys out of the way here and I'm going to put him at the top of, I doubt it, but possible. Um, yeah, I mean, he would certainly have value to a competing team and because of how bird rights work and because of how you can sign your go over the cap to sign your own players, um, contending teams who are over the cap would probably need to make a trade in order to give him the contract that he's looking for. So I could see him, I could see this happening. I don't think it's going to, but I don't think it's, he's not in the same category as um, Emmanuel quickly. Let's move on. Okay, Chris Boucher. So Chris Boucher is a divisive figure uh, in Raptors fandom. He is a spark plug power forward who really, he can win you games. We've seen it this season. His energy, offensive rebounding, lob catching, shot making, kind of go, 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 really shove the ball down the other team's throat. He can win you games. On the other hand, he can lose you games because he makes dumb decisions. He's kind of selfish. Uh, he's not the greatest defender. All, with all of that said, you have to keep in mind kind of what the Raptors have been like for the past four years, which is he he is very consistent year to year. If you go into his uh, basketball reference page, open up the per 36 tab, his year by year by year, his, his stats are almost identical. You know what you're going to get from him in terms of production over a large period of time. And he's been one of the only good bench players the Raptors have had for the past four seasons because he actually produces, he actually puts stats on the board, which is more than you can say for almost anybody else who's been on the Raptors bench. So I like him. I do. I like Chris Boucher. I know he's not like some people hate him, but I, I like him. I think he's a good player. And the, here's the, the important part. He is in Darko Ryakovich's doghouse. He did not get a lot of time this season, especially toward the end of the year when they were tanking and you're like, oh, okay, let's give Chris Boucher some minutes because there were a lot of guys who aren't very good, uh, but he didn't. They kept him, they benched him basically until it became just like, oh my, like he did start getting minutes because it was almost embarrassing the way that they were losing. And he, he did a really good job. In fact, the game he got injured, he was looked like a star player. And with all of that said, okay, he is uh, a good enough player on a good enough contract. He's making about $10 million this coming season, and then his contract is over. He's on, his production to contract ratio is good. He has skills that other competing teams are gonna be looking for, and the Raptors aren't playing him. So let's go ahead and take Chris Boucher, put him up here. Um, Chris Boucher being the final player on the Raptors uh, championship squad. And I don't think he's going to be back next season. I think they're going to they're going to trade him this season, I think. So, you know, the last vestige of the Toronto Raptors championship run will be traded, in my opinion. And that's the list. That's the tier list. Uh, I hope you enjoyed doing it with me. I love this content. Whenever it comes up on my feed, I always click on it and watch it pretty much to the end. Um, and let me just quickly address kind of, you know, a footnote at the end of this video, um, why I started doing shorts content and why I stopped long form content. So first of all, long form videos take a long time to make. And I was kind of getting burned out doing them, um, especially if the video did not do well. So it would take like maybe a week, maybe a bit more than a week to make. And then if it sucked or people didn't look at it or whatever, I it, it sucked as a content creator. You'd be like, okay, I spent all this time, nobody watched it. Whereas with shorts, if nobody watches it, well, like one video does well and then another one doesn't, you know, it took like, you know, a day or, or under a day to make. Another thing is, is that shorts allow me to be more immediate. I can address stories that are in the press. I can, you know, put out a video that it talks about a trade. I can react to things, whereas you have to be more proactive with a long form video. So I like that as well. And also, you know, I just kind of like the format a little bit better. 
to be honest. It's fun to do. I get to joke around, be lighthearted, and it's under a minute. It's a sound bite. It's fun to make. I think they're fun to watch. I can put them on social media. That's pretty much it. You know, it's not that complicated. I kind of like making them. I hope you enjoy watching them. And if you have only watched my long form stuff, I, I encourage you to watch the shorts because I like making them. I think they're good content, but that's pretty much the long and short of it. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and uh, I might make more of this kind of video if you guys like it and it gets enough views. So if you did like it, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, uh, share it on social media, do all that kind of stuff, leave a comment, all that good stuff. And I will talk to you next time.